on the air tonight with that blistering hot weather now turning deadly. Tens of millions of us at risk as skies turn smoky in the Midwest. All of it adding to the travel nightmares from flight delays to separately some new footage of a plane's very scary emergency landing. We are live with team coverage on all of it in just a minute. Also breaking tonight, look at this. Pieces of the Titan mini sub pulled from the ocean what investigators found, and what they're hoping to learn from it. Plus, new details on the former NFL quarterbacks killed swimming off the coast of Florida. How this is putting a new spotlight on the dangers of the open water and why one local sheriff is so frustrated. And in tonight's original, a story from post Row America, the new lawsuit from a woman who says she was pretty much pressured to continue her pregnancy despite a life-threatening condition. And just breaking in the last hour, one of the world's biggest superstars hospitalized in the ICU. We'll talk about what's happening to Madonna right now and the new details just coming in. Hey, I'm Hallie, and tonight it is a record-breaking, blistering heat wave that's gone from dangerous to deadly, with officials basically begging people to take this seriously. At least nine people killed in one Texas county that hit 115 degrees. Listen. This is heat like we've not seen here before. Please, please, please. Deaths due to heat stroke are ruled as accidents, and accidents by definition are preventable deaths. All these deaths could have been prevented. That's the medical examiner there. Texas is right now one of the hottest places on Earth. It feels like well above 110 degrees in a lot of spots. That's as 20 states now are dealing with unhealthy and in some cases dangerous air quality. That's 125 million of us. Look at Chicago. It's got the second worst air quality in the world, just behind Toronto. Detroit, Pittsburgh, Louisville, also unhealthy because of all that smoke drifting in from those Canadian wildfires. And the weather is just one part of an epic travel mess now. You have people stranded for days because of this domino effect of canceled and delayed flights. Look at them, airports around the country. That does not look fun. That's not where you want to be. You can see the numbers here, something like 900 cancellations, 4,000 delays. And as if that weren't bad enough, we're getting some new pictures tonight of this scary emergency landing in North Carolina. See that Delta flight's nose? It is on the tarmac because it came into the runway with no landing gear. Thankfully, nobody was hurt. We have a team of correspondents covering all of this. Sam Brock in New Orleans for us, Shaq Brewster in Chicago, and Tom Costello at Boston's Logan Airport. I want to go first to Sam because, Sam, I think those were incredibly stark words from the medical examiner, right? These deaths could be preventable as this weather is is incredibly dangerous. Yeah, it's sobering and a stark reminder, Hallie, as you cite that figure of nine people who have died from heat related illness. Now, thankfully, here in Louisiana and specifically in New Orleans, I have asked whether they've seen any fatalities so far. And the answer is no. You go back a couple of weeks. There was another heat event where the heat index rose to 117 here. That was only a one day event. They got about 40 or 50 phone calls for people suffering from illness, but it did not become fatal. Now, though, we have hundreds of thousands of people coming into the city of New Orleans for this weekend and the S festival. It's a huge deal. These streets are going to be packed, but a lot of folks are going to be coming in to southeast Louisiana and not understanding the level of heat and humidity that's at play here. I did speak with the director of Homeland Security for the city of New Orleans, who talked a little bit more about what they're doing on the ground in real time, communicating with other agencies, Ali, namely the governor's office, FEMA as well, so state and federal agencies. They're actually going and counting the number of people in homeless shelters as they've expanded the capacity. But should they need to open new ones, they will. The city of New Orleans also also has buses that could become mobile cooling centers. So all of these different strategies are at play. But another thing I want to highlight that's going on right now in New Orleans is you have a community of people, four to 500 of them, who are under right now a boil water advisory. And this coincides with this incredible heat wave. I spoke with Willie Williams Jr. He moved to the seventh ward a couple decades ago and has been watching these communities evolve. He says the infrastructure issues are always there and always present. And it's happening now at a really bad time. Here's a portion of our conversation. Longevity, intensity, the fact that I noticed my air conditioning system will not cut off at night, and that's unusual. I didn't wash my toothbrush with uh, faucet water. I used bottled water. Brush my teeth, use bottled water to rinse. Now, Hallie, the concern right now for city officials is people drinking that water. There's no evidence of that going on right now. And there is good news as well. The city says they should have this problem fixed by about lunchtime tomorrow. Yeah. 
That would be huge for folks there. Sam Brock live for us in New Orleans. Sam, thank you very much. It is not just the heat. It is the quality of the air that people are breathing further up in the Midwest and heading for the Northeast. Shaq Brewster is on that angle for us in Chicago. Hey, Shaq. Hi there. Well, here in Chicago, we're used to talking about extreme cold or sometimes even extreme heat. But today, one official is describing the condition as extremely poor air quality. You see what it looks like behind me in the downtown area. I'll tell you, being here on the ground, you can also smell the smoke in the air. And we're getting more reports of people feeling the impacts of it. People talking about congestion, coughing, having a hoarse voice. One lung doctor saying that they have been receiving an increase in calls from patients asking about the impact of this air and warning asthma patients that there is a risk for an increased ICU admissions if this air quality does not improve. So what's being advised? Well, essentially everyone is being advised to keep their out outdoor activity uh, extremely limited. Don't engage in any running, any strenuous activity. If you are one of those high-risk patients, if you're a child, senior, if you have any heart or lung conditions, you're being advised to uh, avoid being outside altogether. Officials also also advising uh, this is not a bad time also to throw that mask on. Chicago dealing with that very unhealthy air quality for much of the day. Uh, that's a condition that forecasters say will likely improve over the next day or so. But for now, you're hearing the advice to avoid being outside as much as possible as the smoke from those Canadian wildfires continues to make its impact. Back to you. Our thanks to Shaq Brewster in Chicago there. Let me get to Boston now, where Tom Costello is posted up with this travel mess at the airports. I've seen it called a flight mare, Tom, because it is so not ideal. Weather separately, we're going to talk about that in a second, but let me start with something not related to the weather, but this scary emergency landing. We're seeing some of these new images of that Delta plane that came in, landed without nose gear. Tell us more about it. Yeah. So this was flight 1092 Atlanta into Charlotte, North Carolina today, this morning. And it came in and the nose gear indicator suggested to the pilots they would not have the nose gear. So here's what they did before you take the video. They came in like this. They came in with the nose up so that they could wow. land on the back uh, landing gear. And then they very gently brought it down. All right, now take the video, take the photos. And you can see that that nose gear went right into the runway. Thankfully, 100 people on board this flight, but they gingerly put the thing down. No injuries whatsoever. And as you would expect, fire rescue responded and made sure that they had no flames. That's good news. Everybody's safe. And the, the investigation will be, well, what happened? Why did the nose landing gear collapse or not, not deploy? We simply don't know at this point. OK, bigger story right now nationwide. We still have this problem with travel because, of course, weather has created such a problem in so many cities, especially in New York City. We've had ground delays and ground, flight, ground stops at all three major New York City airports. Also, Teterboro, even Toronto has been affected today. And then on top of all of that, the ripple effect from all of this spreads across the country. Florida has been hit hard. Even Denver, because Denver is a, a United hub, so is Newark. Newark's been hit hard. A lot of reasons for this, but the bottom line today at this moment, 910 flight cancellations, 400 make that 4,400 delays, 910 cancellations, 4,400 delays right now, Hallie. Tom, you talk about um, the, and again, there is an accountability factor here, right? Otherwise known as the blame game here. Yes, weather obviously played a part. That was the initial cause. These storms, this extreme weather we've seen. But what's interesting is you're starting to see fingers point at both the FAA and some of the airlines themselves. Tell us more. Uh, there is not one single answer. United's had a lot yeah. of problems, staffing problems with its flight attendants. It hasn't had enough flight attendants. Now it's offering triple pay for off-duty flight attendants to come in and pick up the slack. The FAA still has a problem with not enough air traffic controllers. That's a years-long problem. And JetBlue also has been caught up a little bit today in all of these disruptions. So many reasons for this. It's not easy to just blame one thing or one, one airline. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. Good context. Tom Costello live for us at Boston. Logan, uh, good luck trying to get back home to D.C., Tom. Thank you very much. Tonight, the first look at what is left of that Titan mini sub that imploded near the Titanic wreckage last week. Look at this. You can see it here. Pieces of steel, chunks of metal, what looks like electrical wires being lifted off of this ship at a Canadian Coast Guard pier in St. John's in Newfoundland. These pieces were found by a remote operated vehicle that's been searching the ocean floor for any wreckage. Investigators are hoping to learn more about what happened before that catastrophic implosion that killed all five people on board.
Ron Allen is joining us now. He was in Newfoundland for a lot of the rescue, search and rescue operation that obviously then turned into recovery, Ron. What do we know about what they found so far and where the investigation goes now? Well, we don't know exactly what these pieces are, but it's significant that they're pretty sizable pieces, yeah. and it's significant that they were found at all when you remember the fact that they were some two and a half miles deep in the ocean in what the Coast Guard and others described as a very, very challenging, dangerous environment, dark, deep, and, and that's why a remote robotic device was used to find these uh, objects. It's the same the, the device that was used to find the wreckage in the first place, uh, very close to where the Titanic is. Remember the, uh, the Titan vessel going down apparently exploded or imploded around an hour and 45 minutes into its journey. It would have taken about two hours to get to the Titanic, so it never apparently reached the destination. Uh, the uh, salvage company that was involved in this says that their operations out there are now done, uh, so whatever they brought back is what investigators will have to look at. And there are obviously a lot of questions about what caused this. As we know, there were a lot of questions about the, the company, about the, the CEO uh, who was on aboard, who was piloting the craft, Stockton Rush. Uh, and there was criticism from inside the company and outside the company in the maritime industry that this this submersible had not been certified or licensed or regulated or inspected by any outside agency that does that sort of thing in the maritime industry. He was an innovator. He was pushing the boundaries, we know. And there were many voices raised before this voyage that said that this craft was not, was not really fit to go so deep and to take passengers. The passengers, of course, were aware of that. And one who we talked to who did this journey about a year ago said, said that he knew the risks, but he did it anyway, and he was glad that he did. But of course, now we have this disaster with um, uh, five lo lost lives. So there are a myriad of investigations. The U.S. Coast Guard is leading the way, along with the U.S. National Transportation Safety Board. The Canadians are also investigating to determine cause, to determine whether there are new rules that need to be applied, whether there's any criminal responsibility here, uh, and that's going to take some time. Allie? Ron Allen, thank you very much for that reporting. Appreciate it. Late tonight, we are seeing President Biden trying to reclaim what was initially supposed to be an insult, embracing Bidenomics and trying to show he is turning things around on the economy, he says. Listen. I think it's a plan that I'll, I'm happy to call Bidenomics. Bidenomics is about building an economy from the middle out and the bottom up, not the top down. Guess what? <laughs> Bidenomics is working. Okay, but there are a couple complicating factors here, right? That's the backdrop. Look at this. Only about a third of Americans actually do think Bidenomics is working. They actually do think that President Biden is doing a good job handling the economy. Less than a quarter think the economy is in a good shape. Second factor here, there's the threat of a real recession. As the Fed chair is hinting today at two more interest rate hikes this year and saying, yes, even though an economic downturn is not a sure thing, far from it, it is still within the realm of possibility even a, uh, you know, a recession. Uh, it, to me, it's not the most likely case, but it's certainly possible. And of course, many forecasters do predict that. Mike Memoli is joining us now from Chicago. So, ma'am, you have summed it up by, by saying that President Biden is in some ways trying to put poetry to the prose with this Bidenomics push. But as we just saw, right, there are voters who don't think there's a lot of poetry in the economy to begin with here. Whatever happens economically is going to be a huge factor come next November. Yeah, that's right, Hallie. I mean, the White House, the Biden campaign, they look at this gap between what they think is a strong record of accomplishment, what they see in terms of uh, unemployment numbers, job creation numbers, and what polls show, which is that people think the country is heading in the wrong direction and that the president is not getting the credit they think he deserves uh, for his accomplishments. And so today's speech really did represent an effort to try to uh, do the reverse of campaigning in poetry and governing in pro pro prose. We've been talking so much about the long slog of sauce making in Washington. Well, now the president, as he enters campaign mode, has a chance to try to step back, present to voters, here's what we've done. We have the infrastructure law. We have the Chips and Science Act. We have some of the steps we've taken in the Inflation Reduction Act to try to give you more breathing room, to reverse trickle down, which benefited the wealthy, and, and focus on the middle class. But there is some risk here, right? This is part of an effort to turn Bidenomics as a Republican attack line into a, a, a offensive measure. But I spoke with Lyle Brand She's the National Economic Council director and said, isn't there some risk here in embracing 
Bidenomics if the economy turns south again. Here's what she had to say to that. It's certainly true. There's always risk in the economy. Uh, and of course, we just navigated through. The president just uh, signed a historic bipartisan budget agreement that removed one of the biggest sources of manufactured risk. So manufactured risk, she's, of course, talking about that debt ceiling standoff. There's more on the horizon, of course, not to get too inside the beltway, but the funding bills that need to come due at the end of September, whether we have a shutdown, Lael Brainer downplaying that for now, but we'll see where we are in a couple of months, Allie. Well, we're going to see where we are on that front. We know that the economy is such a huge driver for people when it comes to elections. What we've also learned is that another factor that voters are thinking about based on polling is, frankly, President Biden's age. And you have some new reporting on how, similar to Biden, Bidenomics, he's trying to take something and twist it into his favor, right? In other words, take something that was meant to be an insult and turn it into kind of a joke, right? He's talking about his age. He's joking about his age a lot more. Let me play a little mashup here. I know I don't look that old, I know. <laughs> I'm a little under 103. Well, I look like I'm only t still 29, but uh, <laughs> think about it. I know I'm 198 years old. It gets a laugh every time. Talk through the strategy from the folks that you're talking right. to behind the scenes on this, Mem. Yeah, I mean, this is an element, I think, a little bit more of uh, making some lemonade out of lemons. There's nothing they can do about the fact that the president every day sets a new record as the oldest president in American history. But there's a long track record of success for politicians in sort of self-deprecating humor. We saw it with Ronald Reagan, one of the most famous debate lines ever against Walter Mondale. I'm not going to make his youth and inexperience an issue. We saw, though, unsuccessfully Bob Dole against Bill Clinton, uh, John McCain against Barack Obama try to do the same, going on SNL, making jokes, going on the late night shows. And so a lot of this will be determined in some ways by who the Republican opponent is. Is it Donald Trump, who himself had been the oldest president until Joe Biden came along? Mike, I'm only live for us there uh, in a smoky Chicago, as we've talked about. Ma'am, thank you very much. Get home safely. We are just hearing tonight from a lawyer for the family of Jordan Neely after a former Marine pleaded not guilty today to charges related to his death. This lawyer says Daniel Penny had no right to put his hands on Neely in that New York City subway that chokehold death back in May. Listen. We can't become a society where people are looking for a reason to hurt someone else or looking for a reason to act out. You'll remember back in May, witnesses say Neely had been shouting threats on the subway when Penny pinned him to the floor with the help of two others. We want to warn you, the video of that incident is hard to watch. We're only going to show it to you once just for context here. Penny held Neely in a chokehold with two other passengers nearby seeming to help. Penny later said he was acting in self-defense. Neely, of course, died after that incident. It's a case that has sparked so much anger, not just over the delay in arresting and charging Penny, but also because of the way the city deals with homelessness and mental health. Emily Aketa joins us now. And Emily, prosecutors in the case have also filed some new documents about evidence from that day. Tell us more. Yeah, that's right, Hallie. We're getting some insight around what could be presented to jurors come later this year, including we're learning that the video that you just showed capturing the deadly chokehold on camera, well, it's not the only one. Documents revealing that police have obtained at least five cell phone videos of that May 1st incident. We're also seeing what Daniel Penny told police that same day. We have a piece of his police statement that reads in part, he was trying to roll up, referring to uh, Jordan Neely. I had him pretty good. I was in the Marine Corps, a man was acting irate, dropping things on the floor, saying he doesn't care if he goes to jail, he doesn't care if he gets killed or does. Penny wasn't arrested until nearly two weeks after the incident, and that delay sparked citywide protests that spilled onto subway tracks, even shutting down some subway lines temporarily as they called for criminal charges. Jordan Neely's family lawyers today speaking out, calling today's arraignment a victory, a step closer towards achieving justice for Jordan Neely saying that any reasonable person would know that a minutes-long chokehold would lead to death, Howie. Emily, Penny's attorneys say that they are confident um, that a jury will see that he is, in fact, not guilty. How do they see this playing out? Where does this go? 
so we saw Daniel Penny enter the courthouse behind me just before 10 a.m. He was looking straight forward. He was stoic. He didn't make any uh, he didn't make any comments to the media, but he told the judge not guilty. Those two words referring to two charges that he's facing criminally negligent homicide and second degree manslaughter. If convicted, he could face up to 19 years in jail. But his legal team is confident that jurors will rule in Penny's favor. Take a listen here. Danny won't be the only one on trial. The right and duty to defend one another will be on trial, too. So our legal team at Razor and Kniff is ready to fight for Danny and for every New Yorker's right and duty to defend each other when faced with grave harm. Well, that legal team did release some pre-recorded videos of Daniel Penny explaining what happened. They would not say whether he would be taking the stand in this trial. The next court date, Hallie, is in October. Emily Aketa live for us there in Manhattan. Emily, thank you very much. Overseas now, uh, and President Biden saying today things are not looking good for Russian President Putin since that attempted revolt in Russia led by the head of the Wagner Group. Listen to what the president is saying here in Washington when asked by our own Kristen Welker. It's hard to tell, but he's, he's clearly losing the war in Iraq. He's losing the war at home. And he has uh, become a bit of a pariah around the world. It comes as we're getting this new video in of Putin taking a kind of walkabout here in southern Russia, talking about tourism reportedly not mentioning the uprising, but an interesting demonstration of his visibility there in the southern part of the country. The head of the Wagner Group now, this new reporting indicates Yevgeny Prigozhin may have had some inside help from a senior Russian general, according to the New York Times, citing U.S. officials briefed on the matter. The Kremlin says that's speculation and gossip and that the army was standing by Putin. Raf Sanchez is joining us now from Ukraine. A lot of moving pieces here, Raf, right? You're seeing Putin coming out in this sort of show of... Um, show of visibility, if you will. You've got this reporting out from the New York Times and some others suggesting that Prigozhin may have had other goals, may have had potentially inside help. NBC has not confirmed that. And now you're hearing from an official about new concerns over nukes. Yeah, Holly. So part of this puzzle is playing out in Belarus, which is about 30 miles that way. Until pretty recently, Belarus, a quiet corner of Eastern Europe, no longer the case. One, it is the home to Evgeny Prigozhin as he goes into exile, going into exile presumably with a Kremlin target on his back for the rest of his life. And pretty soon, Vladimir Putin is going to transfer tactical nuclear warheads to Belarus. Now, in terms of Ukraine's response, President Zelensky spoke earlier. He said they're very closely tracked. Prigozhin's arrival in Belarus. He says at this point there's no indication he's bringing a lot of mercenaries with him. On the nuclear issue, we had a chance earlier to speak to the governor of Chernihiv, that's this border region, and I asked him how concerned he is about the prospect of Russian nuclear weapons just over the border. Take a listen. In this war, we have to be ready for anything. Of course, we are worried about the use of tactical nuclear weapons. Does Russia have enough common sense not to use them? I have my doubts. But either way, we will fight to the end, because this is our land, and this gives us strength. We are confident we will win this. And, Hallie, we've been talking about this nuclear issue for some time now. The message has been consistent from officials at the White House. They are not seeing any indication that Russia is getting closer to using a nuclear weapon, and there's been no change to America's nuclear posture. Hallie. Raf, you talk about what's happening on the actual battlefield. There was this attack overnight that is getting so much attention because it was on a local pizza restaurant, killing 11 people, hurt more than 50. Um, there was a local man arrested accused of helping Russia here. Tell us more about that. Yes, yeah, so Ukraine's domestic intelligence agency, the SBU, is saying they have arrested a gas transportation company worker who they say acted as a scout for the Russians. I want to show you just a little bit of the statement the SBU put out earlier. They said, in order to fulfill the enemy's instructions, the agent, this gas worker, made a covert video recording of the establishment, the restaurant. After the suspect forwarded the recorded file to Russian military intelligence, the statement says the Russians went on to bomb the this pizza parlor. Now, Hallie, among the 11 people dead there, twin sisters, 14 years old, Anna and Yulia, they had just finished the school year. They were going into their summer vacation. They were at that restaurant with their parents when that missile struck. Hallie. It's a 
horrific to hear as is so much of what's happening in Ukraine. Raf Sanchez, thank you very much for that reporting. Coming up, we've got some breaking news to get to here on the show. One of the world's biggest stars is hospitalized in the ICU. What else we're learning about how Madonna is doing tonight? Plus, the moment a woman who went overboard on a cruise ship is rescued from the water. And gymnastic superstar Simone Biles may be making a comeback back on the mat in her first competition in years. What this could mean for the sport after the break. Some shocking news break in in just the last hour here. One of the world's biggest stars is recovering after she was sent to the ICU after what her manager calls a serious bacterial infection. And yes, of course, we are talking about Madonna. I want to bring in NBC's Ann Thompson, who is following this story for us. She apparently um, has been in the hospital, was in the hospital, in the ICU for several days. And we're just learning about this now. What else do we know? We are, Hallie. Um, this apparently happened on Saturday when Madonna, who is 64 years old, came down with what has been called this serious bacterial infection. That word comes from her agent. Um, he says that she spent several days in the ICU. The good news tonight is that she is recovering. But the tough thing for Madonna fans is this means that her celebration tour, which was supposed to kick off on July 15th in Vancouver, British Columbia, has been put on hold. That tour was to be a celebration of her 40 years in the music industry. And it's a global tour that she has planned. But that is now all on pause as she recovers from this serious bacterial infection. There is no word tonight from her agent about where she was treated, where she is, where she is recovering, all things that her fans want to know, and most importantly, when she will get back on stage. But again, Madonna, in the last few days, has been treated for a serious bacterial infection, serious enough to put her in the ICU, but her agent says she is recovering. Hallie? That is the good news that she is, according to her agent, recovering. A lot of people, of course, uh, just stunned by this. Ann Thompson, thank you very much for that. Let's take you down to Florida, where tonight officials there are saying there were no rip currents present at the beach where former NFL quarterback Ryan Mallett drowned, but the conditions were at something they call a medium hazard level. That's coming as first responders say they're frustrated that other people are not listening to their warnings on how to stay safe. A local sheriff's county confirming late last night that first responders pulled the 35-year-old from the water off a beach in Destin, Florida. Again, Ryan Mallett, former NFL quarterback. Officials say he was part of a group of people that had been swimming out there and then were struggling to try to make their way back to shore. That is happening at the same time as separately. Dangerous rip currents have killed 11 people along the Gulf Coast in just the last two weeks. Stephanie Gosk joins us now. What else do we know about what was happening in the water when Mallett died? So, Hallie, there was a, a yellow flag warning, which means people can still go in the water, but they have to be cautious, and there is a risk of rip currents. Um, you know, you cite that there were no rip currents there at that particular location, but, you know, if you're caught in one of those rip currents, it can be really dangerous, and the Panhandle has had a very bad month when it comes to people drowning in rip currents. Just one day in Panama City Beach last Saturday, 39 people were pulled out of the water. That beach has seen seven people drown this month, which makes it the most dangerous beach in the country right now. And they are seeing those rip currents again today. Hallie? The, the the sheriff of the county encompassing Panama City Beach, which, Steph, as you know, we talked about yesterday and covered that it is now the deadliest beach in the country, so frustra frustrated, right, talked about these, what they described as unnecessary deaths and say people are just not listening to the first responders who are giving them warnings, basically saying that they're giving them, I'm, I'm quoting here, that they've been cursed and given the finger. It seems like there is a tension point building. Yeah, because, I mean, these first responders, as well as the, the people who handle beach safety, they put up these warnings for, for a reason. And, and you know, I mentioned the yellow flag. There is a single red flag, which means there is a, a real danger of rip currents. And then there's a double red flag, which means don't go in the water at all. No one's allowed in the water. They've been issuing citations to people who break the rules. And a few beach safety people have been saying that they're actually telling people what to do and they're not listening. Listen to what this beach safety director said. He, he's a beach safety director for one of the beaches on the Panhandle. We've put a considerable amount of effort in, in effective messaging to let people know that the gravity of the situation here can be real. 
even though they get the message, they openly defy it. And the results can be devastating. They can be deadly because when you get caught in a rip current, a rip current is a is a current that moves off of the beach and it pulls you out to sea. It's on the surface of the water. What you're supposed to do is not try to swim against it because it can right. be as extreme as five miles an hour. You can't swim that fast. You're supposed to swim parallel to the beach. So don't panic. Keep your head above water and try to swim parallel to the beach. Parents should put life vests on their kids in the water. Stephanie Goss, thank you very much. You're Let's welcome. get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, seven-time NASCAR champ Jimmy Johnson is withdrawing from this weekend's race. Police say his wife's parents and their grandson were found dead in an apparent murder-suicide. Officials think it was Johnson's mother-in-law who shot and killed her husband and 11-year-old grandson before she died by suicide. Number two, more than half of Americans surveyed in the last year reported facing harassment online and hate, according to a new report from the Anti-Defamation League. And for transgender people, that number is way higher, with 70% of people reporting that kind of thing. According to the ADL, reports of online harassment are up more than 10% since last year. Number three, Costco is cracking down on people who share memberships. They say they're going to start making people show matching photo IDs at checkout, meaning like your ID has to match your Costco membership card. Costco says more and more people are taking advantage of membership sharing since they started rolling out self-checkout at a lot of its stores. Number four, the CEO of Anheuser-Busch, the parent company of Bud Light, is speaking today now about the boycott of Bud Light. Remember, Bud Light partnered with that trans influencer for an online promotion. Well, now the head of Anheuser-Busch, Brennan Whitworth, is telling CBS the company is sending financial help to wholesalers and distributors affected by the boycott. Sales of Bud Light have plummeted lately, with the beer recently losing its top spot as America's best-selling one, Jamadella. Number five, take a look at this video of a passenger on the Royal Caribbean cruise being rescued after falling overboard from the 10th floor deck near the Dominican Republic. According to the Coast Guard, officials said the passenger was taken to a hospital for evaluation. The Coast Guard says it's looking into how the passenger ended up overboard. Tonight, we are learning about what could be an extraordinary gymnastics comeback. Simone Biles getting back to competition in August for her first meet since dropping out of her final events back at the Olympics in Tokyo in 2021. I bet you remember that, right? Biles withdrew from some competitions. She said she wanted to focus on her mental health as she dealt with something that she and other gymnasts call the twisties. It's this feeling of being lost in the air. You go up for a jump, you go up for a move or a flip, you don't know where you are. That can be super dangerous. Biles, of course, is like a, a goat. I mean, she's one of the all-time greats, greatest of all time, tied with Shannon Miller for the most Olympic medals ever for a female gymnast. She's won 25 world championship medals. Noah Pransky is joining us now. The potential significance of this maybe comeback is huge, right? Like, could we see her at the Olympics next year? So we call it a maybe comeback because all we know right now is that she has been named an entrant in this competition in Chicago. But the speculation is that this is a tune-up for the national championships later that month, a tune-up then for the world championships, which is a tune-up for the Paris Olympics. No one would be shocked if she returns to the top of her game, but she's been doing this for a long time. She has been a seven-time Olympic medal, as you mentioned, 19-time world medalist, the most decorated U.S. woman Olympic gymnast ever. But she's trying to make this comeback, potentially age 27 in the Olympics, something that would previously be unheard of. You think back to the 70s, Nadia Comaneci at age 14, the sport long dominated by teenagers. But these days, the sport has followed her. She's changed the game. She's really made it a power sport where strength is an asset and not a detriment. And at age 27, this kind of thing is a possibility, thanks to her strength and the way she's changed gymnastics. She has, and you talk about it, Noah, but like the idea that she has been such a voice, such a present, a presence on not just issues like mental health, but also testifying about abuse, for example, from that USA Gymnastics Dr. Larry Nasser. Um, there is a, a symbolism and a significance of her coming back to competition that goes beyond simply, you know, the routines and the moves. She's had a lot of ups and downs over the last few years, and it was 2021, remember, she had the twisties, which for someone who doesn't know gymnastics, it's like the yips you get in golf or baseball. You just can't quite function the way you've been doing it for 20-something years. Um, this is what she said on the Today Show a couple years ago. I love this sport so much, but it's hard. I'm sorry. 
and I don't think people understand the magnitude of what I go through, but for so many years to go through everything that I've gone through, put on a front, I'm proud of myself, and I'm happy that I can be a leader for the survivors. If you remember, she did come back in the Tokyo Olympics to win two more medals after withdrawing herself from several events. She might be trying to make this comeback again, and she's inspired so many young gymnasts with her strength on the mat and on the bars. She may be inspiring a whole other generation, too, when it comes to mental health as well. Noah Pransky, thank you very much. Yeah. Appreciate that. Sure, thank you. When we come back. Unbelievable and intense anger in France after the police killing of a 17-year-old. Look at this, what we're learning about the incident coming up. So-called revenge fires are putting an ex-cop behind bars, who prosecutors say he targeted later in the local. But first, there is this tense situation tonight near Paris, with protests erupting over the police shooting death of a 17-year-old delivery driver. We're going to show you some video of what happened here. Two police officers leaning into the driver's side window of a yellow car. Before the vehicle pulls away, the car pulls away, one officer fires into the window. The car is later seen crashed into a post nearby. Lawyers say the 17-year-old, identified only by his first name, Niel, was hurt by a gunshot and died at the scene. 31 people have been arrested now in the demonstrations that followed. 25 police officers hurt. And look at this. This is the aftermath of 40 cars burned in protests overnight. The French government has boosted police presence and officials are calling for calm. Matt Bradley joins us now. Hey, Matt, bring us up to speed. Yeah, Hallie, so you described that situation and what you saw on the video, that video came out after there were comments by the police to the French press saying that actually Niel had charged that police checkpoint. He drove into it and that these officers had to fire at him in order to save their own lives. Now, as you can see from that video, that's not the case at all. And in fact, it looks as though there were words exchanged. We could hear the officers yelling. It wasn't clear whether Niel was responding. But that is part of the anger that's coming out here, is that we're seeing the way that the police kind of in, in the French media misrepresented the original incident. And then now, with the video coming out, showing exactly what happened. And, you know, this is just fitting exactly the same kind of pattern that our viewers are going to be very, very familiar with here in the, uh, in the United States, which is this sort of, you know, a, a lot of confusion about what exactly went on. And then suddenly video surfaces and the officers are very much implicated. And that's why, you know, these police shootings are very rare in France. Um, but the fact is, is that when they do happen, it really brings up a lot of anger. Now, there were 13 such police shootings last year. There was one so far this year. So according to activists and those who are trying to fight uh, for victims of police brutality in France, they say that this represents a really big increase in the number of people who are killed at these checkpoints. They're almost always, according to these activists, men of color, normally of Middle Eastern or African descent. And so that's why we're starting to see a lot of violence and a lot of anger we're really getting ready. We're, we're hearing from the police that they're putting out 20,000 police officers in cities and towns throughout France, mostly in the banlieue or suburbs of Paris, where the violence from last night occurred. They're really preparing for quite a lot more violence tonight. Hallie? We will see what happens. Matt Bradley, thank you very much for keeping an eye on that. Coming up here on the show, a new lawsuit against a center accused of misdiagnosing a woman's pregnancy and putting her life at risk. Our in-depth reporting on so-called crisis care centers in tonight's original. Plus, why a town is letting younger teens vote later in the local. To tonight's original now with in-depth reporting on a topic we've been watching. And tonight we are now hearing from a lawyer who is suing with a client, a so-called crisis pregnancy center. These are organizations that some say try to push pregnant women not to have abortions. They're not just in states where abortion access is restricted since the overturning of Roe versus Wade more than a year ago. One Massachusetts-based abortion rights group estimates they outnumber abortion clinics three to one in that state, which of course is deep blue. Our Ali Vitali has the story of a woman who allegedly faced a life-threatening pregnancy because she says she went to one. Tonight, a lawyer speaking out about what her clients allegedly experienced at a so-called crisis pregnancy center in Massachusetts. Attorney Shannon Liss Reardon accusing the Clearway Clinic in Worcester of a misdiagnosis of her client's pregnancy. 
telling her the pregnancy was viable when really it was potentially life-threatening. If proper medical care had been provided when she went to Clearway, the pregnancy should have been terminated right then. Liz Reardon says it all started for her client, who was asked to remain anonymous, after a positive at-home pregnancy test. The woman searched online for a safe medical examination to quickly verify the test result. That search led her to the nearby Clearway Clinic. There, they allegedly performed an ultrasound, concluding her pregnancy was healthy. But a month later, her lawyer says, the expecting mother was rushed to the ER with severe abdominal pain. She had to have emergency traumatic surgery, which led to the loss of one of her fallopian tubes. The woman's pregnancy was actually ectopic. Her fertilized egg grew outside of the uterus, according to the suit. It's a rare condition, only 1 to 2 percent of U.S. pregnancies per the CDC, but serious, even deadly if left untreated. You can have rupture of the fallopian tube, which can cause dangerous and life-threatening internal bleeding. And in the case of Liz Reardon's client, could have, should have, been spotted earlier if the exam was done correctly. With appropriate training and, and, a, and an ultrasound that is performed correctly, uh, there really shouldn't be any mistaking a viable intrauterine pregnancy from an ectopic pregnancy. One of the reasons it wasn't, the case now charges, is because the Clearway Clinic's central focus wasn't on the woman's health, but on ensuring she kept her pregnancy. The goal of so-called crisis pregnancy centers like this one. They also very interestingly and concertedly focused on trying to convince her to keep her pregnancy going. These spaces present themselves as reproductive health care providers and come up in searches like the one this woman did. But they're actually focused on stopping women from getting abortions, according to the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. They've been a long-term and widespread barrier for pregnant women seeking medical information and care. No fight, no freedom. But the dangers are seen anew now after the Supreme Court did away with abortion protections last year. There are around 4,000 operations like Clearway running across the U.S. per Planned Parenthood. In a statement to NBC News, Clearway's executive director, Jill Jorgensen, said in part, We cannot speak as to any individual's medical claims or history due to HIPAA regulations. Clearway Clinic has served more than 10,000 women and their families for the past 22 years and have never had a complaint like this. Liz Reardon says she hopes the suit will force Clearway to stop advertising itself as providing standard medical care and says her client is brave for coming forward. Unless there's some legal action, there's not going to be anything to, to stop these clinics from continuing their pattern of deception and misinformation. No justice! Another battlefront in the fight over reproductive care following the overturning of Roe versus Wade more than a year ago. Ali Vitale is joining us now, and Ali, it is noted here that you are in New Hampshire, right? You're traveling with Nikki Haley. The, uh, the access to um, reproductive rights, the abortion debate, is playing on the campaign trail, probably more in the general than the primary, but tell me what you're seeing. Yeah, look, this is certainly an issue where we're watching the collision of stories and lawsuits like this one with the politics and policy of people who are trying to lead, especially on the Republican side, where we're seeing an active primary take place. And I know that while the thinking is that Republicans have pushed for this for a long time, I've covered Repro for about a decade now, and it really does feel in this moment that we're post-Roe that Republicans are in some ways the dogs that caught the car. And frankly, I don't hear uniformly from voters that they think that this is a good thing. Yes, I meet voters, evangelicals mostly, who are in this conservative voting bloc who say that the Dobbs decision was what they wanted, but that's not all of them. Listen to one of the folks that I caught up with today at the Nikki Haley event. Do you think abortion works as an issue right now for Republicans? No, because I think it's, div it's, it's divisive from where the general populace is. So, of course, that voter there is referencing polling that has been consistent over time, frankly, that shows that roughly that more than a majority of Americans, roughly six in 10 of them, want abortion to be legal in all or most cases. Certainly, we've seen this continue to play out in the post row polling environment. And it's why we're watching Republicans, in some cases, dance around this issue, especially when reporters are asking them where they think the weak mark should be. Is it 15? Is it 20? This voter in particular was talking to me about how he might 
might be open to supporting Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. But one of the things that he's concerned about for DeSantis is the fact that he will be tagged with the baggage of doing what he did in Florida, which is passing and signing a six-week abortion ban there. DeSantis has been notably quiet about if he would endorse a federal abortion ban and if it would be at the six-week mark. But nevertheless, that's going to be one of the questions I think that's asked of him, rightly so, as he tries to parlay his agenda from the Sunshine State onto the national stage. But certainly this is not an issue that is going away. It's one that Democrats, as, as my conversations went in, uh, as we led up to the anniversary of the Dobbs decision, Democrats are seeking to leverage this. They see those polls in the same way that Republicans see them. And while Republicans might think they're problematic, and certainly you and I have talked to those folks and strategists, Democrats also see them as a huge opportunity. And we know why after seeing what they did for Democrats in the 2022 midterms. Ali Vitale, live for us on the trail there in New Hampshire with our original tonight. Ali, thank you. NBC News covers hundreds of stories every day, and because you couldn't possibly read or watch or listen to them all, our bureau teams have done it for you. This is what they tell us is going down in their regions in a segment we call The Local. Out of our Northeast Bureau, a former police chief in Maryland has been sentenced to multiple life sentences in prison in what prosecutors called a revenge arson case. He was convicted of setting a dozen fires targeting officials and chiropractors and family members he had problems with. The man was first arrested two years ago after officials found a connection between the fires. His lawyer said he plans to appeal, according to our local station there. Out of our Western Bureau, take a look at this. Some Amtrak train cars partially derailed today after the train hit a truck. This is in Southern California. Local fire officials say uh, nearly 200 people were on board. Some of them were hurt, along with 13 employees. The truck driver went to the hospital. It wasn't immediately clear why that truck ended up on the tracks. Amtrak says it's investigating. And out of our Northeast Bureau, Vermont Town is going to let 16- and 17-year-olds vote in local elections and serve on a town board. That's after the state legislature, made up of mostly Democrats, overrode a veto of the Republican governor on this proposal. It's not the first time we've seen something like this. Some spots in Maryland and California let those younger teens, 16 and 17, vote in, like, again, local elections, school board elections. They're not getting out there for federal elections, but there you go. So to come after, Kevin Spacey is back in court today in the U.K. over a dozen sexual offense charges. We've got more on how much time he faces. What else, goes, what else happens from here? Tonight, prosecutors are getting ready for Kevin Spacey's next court appearance Friday after he appeared in a London court this morning, today, as his four-week sex assault trial begins. The charges against Spacey in the U.K. include indecent and sexual assault and one offense of causing a person to engage in sexual activity without consent that has a maximum punishment of life in prison. The actor faces a dozen of these charges alleged to have taken place between 2001 and 2013. He has pled not guilty to all counts. This sounds like deja vu. It is not the first time Spacey's been facing charges like this. He was also criminally charged with sex assault in the U.S. about four years ago. Those charges were ultimately dropped. The judge told the jurors in Spacey's trial they cannot let the actor's fame get in the way of the evidence they hear, saying, I'm quoting here, Many of you know his name or have seen his films. That does not disqualify you from sitting on this jury. Ali Aruzi is joining us now from outside the courthouse. So what's going to be, in the eyes of prosecutors, the difference now with this trial in London versus the case that was dismissed here in the U.S. in 2019, Ali? Uh, hey, Ali. Well, there are some, some differences. Firstly, the case that was in the States only involved uh, one person. And one of the reasons that case was dismissed was because of evidence. The accuser refused to give over a phone, which uh, Kevin Spacey said was used during the alleged assault. And Spacey said uh, the evidence on the phone would exonerate him. The accuser didn't uh, provide the phone and then refused to give testimony. Here in London, we're talking about four accusers uh, over a 12-year period. So, there's got to be a lot of evidence for the Crown prosecution here to feel like they could bring a case. But I have to tell you, Hallie, the case hasn't started yet. Today was just a jury selection, and it's probably going to start either on Friday or on Monday in earnest. And that's when we'll find, you know, how much evidence the Crown does have against Casey uh, and how much uh, the witnesses are going to give evidence, what kind of evidence they're going to give, what kind of scenarios they're going to paint for the jury. And that 
that could be a lot more damning evidence than the case he faced in the States about four years ago. And the charges he's facing here are also more serious than the charges he faced there. The most serious of the charges here, uh, causing somebody to engage in sexual penetration without their consent, could carry a prison sentence of 19 years. So that's very, very serious for, for Kevin Spacey. The other charges, he could get away with a hefty fine. But if he's found guilty of the last charge, that's a pretty serious case. That's just one short of rape in, in this country. Yeah. But obviously, this case is going to go on for some time. The, the, the judge said that it's going to take at least four weeks, maybe more, for, for this trial to come to a conclusion. And he even selected two extra jurors because of the sensitivity of the case, saying that, you know, if there was a conflict of interest with any of the other jurors, if they happened to know Casey or any of the production companies he worked for and they forgot to fill that out in a form when, when they were signing up for jury duty, then they could quickly be replaced with another juror, which is also slightly unusual, but it also shows what a high-profile case this is. And there was a lot of media attention as well, uh, Hallie. There was a media uh, a huddle here in the morning when he was leaving. All the photographers were crammed around him as he was getting into a, into a cab. And I think that's probably going to go on for the next four or five weeks as the interest in this case uh, remains very high. I'm sure it does. Ali Ruzzi, live for us there uh, from London. Ali, thank you so much. That does it for us this hour. We've got more coverage picking up right now. We are coming on the air tonight with that searing hot weather turning deadly. Millions of people at risk as that wildfire smoke is bearing down on the U.S. again. All of it adding to the travel nightmares from days-long flight delays to new footage of a plane that made a scary landing. We are live from cities across the country with team coverage on all of it. Also breaking tonight, new images of what remains of that Titan mini-sub. What investigators are hoping to find out from what they pulled from the bottom of the ocean. And President Biden testing out a new phrase for his approach to the economy ahead of the election. As the Fed chair warns, we're probably going to get a couple more interest rate hikes this year. We'll tell you what he said. And breaking news on one of the world's biggest superstars delaying her concert tour after some time in the ICU. We're getting new details in just the last couple of minutes on what's happening to Madonna coming up. And one of the greatest gymnasts of all time, Simone Biles, set to return to competition for the first time since the 2021 Olympics. We'll see if it could mean her return at next year's Games in Paris later in the show. Hey there, I'm Hallie, and tonight a record-breaking, blistering heat wave has gone from dangerous to deadly, with officials basically begging people to take this seriously. With at least, at least nine people killed in one Texas county that hit 115 degrees. Listen. This is heat like we've not seen here before. Please, please, please. Deaths due to heat stroke are ruled as accidents. And accidents, by definition, are preventable deaths. All these deaths could have been prevented. That is the medical examiner speaking there, just to give you a sense of how seriously she is asking people to take this. Texas right now is one of the hottest places on Earth. It's well above 110 in a lot of spots. And that's as 20 states are dealing with unhealthy and in some cases dangerous air quality. 125 million of us. Chicago has the second worst air quality in the world behind only Toronto. Detroit, Pittsburgh, Louisville, they're all struggling because of smoke drifting in from those Canadian wildfires. And the weather is just one part of an epic travel mess. You've got people stranded for days because of a domino effect, right? Canceled and delayed flights from airports around the country. That is miserable for people who are trying to fly anywhere right about now, especially on the East Coast. Look at the flights. You can see about 5,000 delays, nearly 1,000 cancellations. And as if that weren't bad enough, we are getting some new pictures tonight of this scary emergency landing in North Carolina when a Delta flight, see that? See how its nose is on the tarmac there? That's because it landed with no landing gear. Thankfully, nobody was hurt. We've got all of it covered tonight with Sam Brock, who is live for us in New Orleans. We've got Shaq Brewster in Chicago, Tom Costello in Boston. Sam, I want to start with you with this heat, right? This baking heat dome that we've talked about now turning deadly. Talk us through it. 
So the heat dome, Hallie, has just been expanding to other parts of the country as well, from California all the way to Florida and, of course, the south where we are. 70 million people right now, Hallie, are under a heat alert, so that's basically one in five Americans looking at conditions like this. And just to reframe this in another way, the National Weather Service in New Orleans just announced there's going to be another excessive heat warning for this area for tomorrow. That is the seventh of the year. Last year, New Orleans had five total. So the seven is a record, and make no mistake about it, it can easily prove to be fatal if you are not taking the necessary precautions throughout the course of the day. So I'm talking about the right amount of hydration, seeking out shade when necessary, and not being outside in the hottest points of the day. And it has been proven fatal in Texas. Now, as far as what's going on on the ground where I am, they are preparing here in New Orleans for hundreds of thousands of people to come to the city for the Essence Festival this weekend. It's a huge deal. Spoke with the director of Homeland Security for New Orleans. He said he's been in contact with other agencies, whether that's the governor's office on the state level or FEMA on the federal level, they are constantly in communication, coming up with strategies of what they're going to do if they have to expand shelters. The current shelters right now have already been enlarged, but he said they are willing to open brand new ones if the demand warrants it. So that's just one thing that's going on. Another in New Orleans, however, there was a water main issue that basically prompted a water boil advisory for people who are right now living not just in this heat, but can't drink the water that's coming out of their faucets. And I spoke to one of those residents, Willie Williams. He lives in the seventh ward. He's been there for decades, Hallie. I asked him about this very strange and unfortunate, unfortunate coinciding of these two events right now. Here's what he told me. First word comes to mind is unfortunate. We're in a hurricane season, excessive heat, heat waves. Some people, as I said before, are going to be more affected than others financially, emotionally. So it's not a very good thing. And Hallie, I spoke with a neighbor of his just a short time before that who told me he really can't afford at his age to go out there on his income level to be buying all this water to make sure that he's squared away inside of his house. So you got to think for these folks on fixed incomes, this is a major problem. But officials say they should have it resolved by tomorrow around lunchtime. Let's sure hope they do. Sam Brock, thank you very much. Live for us there in New Orleans. Appreciate it. If it's not the heat, it is the quality of the air that people are trying to breathe, especially if they're in the Midwest, especially if they're in the Northeast, where some of this dangerous air quality is heading because of that smoke from those Canadian wildfires. Shaq Brewster is in Chicago for us. Hi there. Well, here in Chicago, we're used to talking about extreme cold or sometimes even extreme heat. But today, one official is describing the condition as extremely poor air quality. You see what it looks like behind me in the downtown area. I'll tell you, being here on the ground, you can also smell the smoke in the air. And we're getting more reports of people feeling the impacts of it. People talking about congestion, coughing, having a hoarse voice. One lung doctor saying that they have been receiving an increase in calls from patients asking about the impact of this air and warning asthma patients that there is a risk for an increased ICU admissions if this air quality does not improve. So what's being advised? Well, essentially everyone is being advised to keep their out outdoor activity uh, extremely limited. Don't engage in any running, any strenuous activity. If you are one of those high-risk patients, if you're a child, senior, if you have any heart or lung conditions, you're being advised to uh, avoid being outside altogether. Officials also also advising uh, this is not a bad time also to throw that mask on. Chicago dealing with that very unhealthy air quality for much of the day. Uh, that's a condition that forecasters say will likely improve over the next day or so. But for now, you're hearing the advice to avoid being outside as much as possible as the smoke from those Canadian wildfires continues to make its impact. Back to you. Our thanks to Shaq for that reporting in Chicago. Let's get to Tom Costello now, who is up in Boston. Um, there is a travel mess at airports, Tom. But what we're looking at here is actually not weather related, right? This emergency landing that this Delta plane had to make. Tell us about it. This was a Delta flight coming from Atlanta into Charlotte this morning. And what happened was the nose gear, the landing gear on the nose, would not deploy, would not extend. And so the pilots, they came in like this. They kept the bottom landing gear right on the runway. They kept the nose up so they could come in very slowly, bleed off the, uh, the speed, and then they put it down, and they literally scraped the nose on the runway. So now you can look at the photos and the videos, and you'll see how this all came together at Charlotte. Again, thankfully, nobody injured. 100 people on board when this came down. 
every pilot, uh, commercial airline pilot, is trained to deal with an emergency like this. And fire rescue, as you can see, was on the scene very quickly. Okay, so that was Charlotte. Meanwhile, as you mentioned, we do have this travel mess, this ongoing travel mess. I've got a flash from Boston, where I am right now. We are in a ground stop in Boston. Oh, and we are just the latest case of, of ground stops. We've had them all day. Delays and ground stops affecting all New York City airports today, off and on, off and on. Toronto also affected today, and it is largely because of the weather system. Toronto's also got heavy smoke from the fires. That affects all of us, as you know. So at the very moment, we're looking at a total of, I'm looking at the numbers, 969 cancellations, nearly 1,000, 5,000 delays at this very minute, Hallie. Tom, you have covered some epic travel messes in your time, right? Like, this isn't your first rodeo with these issues with ground stops and delays, et cetera. But it feels like part of the concern here is that we're bracing for a potential huge travel for the July 4th weekend. The TSA has said yeah. it is getting ready for that. Is It is Wednesday. You know, July 4th weekend yeah. probably starts Friday. Is this going to get resolved by then, or is one thing going to melt into the other? Give us some perspective here. You know, first of all, this is this is a mess, but we've all seen worse. Uh, let's fair. put this into yep. perspective. Last summer, you may recall, was bad, and it went on for weeks. And then remember what happened over Christmas with Southwest Airlines, total meltdown. I, I think that this is right now very dependent on Mother Nature. Uh, Got it. Earlier on the Today Show, I said it's all dependent on Al Roker. Not so much. It's all on Mother Nature. <laughs> so Mother Nature is really what can throw a wrench into this whole thing, as we've seen. And it's been parked right over the New York City area, in particular, the busiest airspace in the country. That's been the problem. That's the problem number one. Problem number two, that created delays and cancellations. United got behind. They couldn't catch up. They didn't have enough flight attendants, and therefore you can't fly a plane without the flight attendants. That aggravated the situation even worse. That's problem number two. Problem number three, uh, we still don't have enough air traffic controllers in this country. That's a years-long problem. It's not a quick and easy fix. And so the FAA is behind on air traffic controllers, and they are trying to step up. It takes two to three years to certify a controller. It's not quick. It is not quick. Tom Costello, um, really appreciate you putting that into context for us. You're always good for a gut check. We know, friend. Good luck. Appreciate it. Appreciate you. we got to get to some breaking news that is coming into us in just the last couple of minutes here because we are hearing from the Coast Guard in an official statement saying they have recovered what they describe as human remains from that Titan mini-sub wreckage. Medical experts are set to conduct an analysis in the next few days. It comes as we're getting the first look at some of the pieces from that catastrophic implosion Look at this. You can see it here. Pieces of steel, chunks of metal, what looks like electrical wires being lifted off this ship at a Canadian Coast Guard pier up in St. John's. These pieces were found by an ROV, a remote-operated vehicle. It's been on the ocean floor looking for any wreckage like this. Investigators hope this will provide some clues as to what happened before this sub imploded, killing, of course, all five people who were on board. Ron Allen is joining us now. Ron, what else are we hearing from the Coast Guard tonight? Well, it's surprising that they're saying that there are these presumed human remains that were found along with the other debris there on the ocean floor. Back last week when this was all happening, uh, they described this catastrophic implosion as so violent at such depths that it was unlikely that there would be anything recovered, let alone any sign of human remains of the five who perished in this accident. So <clears throat> that's really startling that they have uh, announced this just a few moments ago. Uh, so that that, along with the other debris here that's been pulled up by the salvage company, is headed to investigators as they try to figure out what caused this to happen. As you know, there was a lot of speculation, a lot of criticism of the company, OceanGate, the CEO, Stockton Rush, uh, the pilot who also died on this on this uh, voyage, on the submersible, uh, because this craft had not been independently certified, safety certified by any of the maritime agencies that do that sort of thing. It wasn't required to as it was operating out in international waters. But there was some criticism from within and outside of the company suggesting that it wasn't, that the, the vessel shouldn't be operating at those depths some two and a half miles down to see the Titanic wreckage uh, with passengers aboard, that it wasn't safe. Uh, and then we had this, this catastrophic accident last week. Uh, so 
more for the investigators to look at. The U.S. Coast Guard is leading the investigation. They've convened what's called a Marine Board of Investigation, which is the highest level of investigation that the Coast Guard can organize. Uh, it's a multinational effort. The Canadians, the French, the British are all involved in this because they had nationals aboard the submersible or because they are involved in this rescue and um, search and recovery operation as it evolved into uh, over the past number of, of days. Um, the salvage company says that its operations out there to bring back more debris have ended. Uh, so they apparently have what they're going to have, and they're going to try and start piecing this together to see what happened. It's not just about the cause. They're trying to determine if there should be more regulations regarding these submersibles, which are largely unregulated, particularly when they operate so far out in international waters. Uh, and again, a lot of criticism of the, the company, OceanGate, the yeah. CEO, the pilot. Uh, the material that this craft was made out of, which is not typical, it was carbon fiber, not steel and, and titanium. Uh, so again, a lot of questions and this big development today that there are, in fact, a Apparently, human remains that have been recovered as well. Very unlikely. Ron Allen, thank you very much for bringing us up to speed. As you say, that's all coming into us late tonight. Appreciate it. Also late tonight, we are seeing President Biden trying to reclaim what was initially supposed to be an insult. He's embracing the term Bidenomics and trying to show that, in his words, he's turning things around on the economy. I think it's a plan that I'll, I'm happy to call Bidenomics. Bidenomics is about building an economy from the middle out and the bottom up, not the top down. Guess what? Bidenomics is working. So that's how the president sees it. But how do voters see it? New polling shows that only about 34 percent of Americans, only about a third of Americans, actually think the president is doing a good job on the economy. Less than a quarter, about one in four, think the economy is in good shape. There's also the threat of a potential recession, right? What happens next? The Fed chair is hinting today, there's Jay Powell, at two more interest rate hikes this year and saying, hey, even though an economic downturn is not a sure thing, it is still within the realm of possibility. Even a, uh, you know, a recession, uh, it, to me, is not the most likely case, but it's certainly possible. And of course, many forecasters do predict that. Mike Memoli is live for us now in Chicago. He's been on the road with President Biden. What's the end game with Bidenomics here, right? Because the idea is the president, it seems to me, is trying to lash himself to an economy that he sees as improving. Could that potentially be a risky bet into next year, depending on what actually happens with the country's economic conditions? Yeah, Hallie, I mean, the White House has been dealing with this real gap between what they, they see as a real record of accomplishment, some positive economic data, especially as it relates to job growth and unemployment numbers, with the fact that you showed those stubborn poll numbers, both the right track, wrong track number, the president's approval ratings, and they know that there's a communication issue here, and they think the president needs to get out there in a more fulsome way and communicate directly to the American people what he thinks he's done, why he's done it, and how they'll ultimately benefit from it. And so that was the idea behind today's Bidenomics. It's also a little bit of uh, you, you govern in prose, but you campaign in poetry. Not sure how much poetry there is in Bidenomics. But there is some risk involved in this strategy because, as I talked to Lael Brainerd, she's the National Economic Council director, she talked about the fact that there are some external factors that have rocked the economy, but that the president has put it on the right track. Take a listen. It's certainly true. There's always risk in the economy. Uh, and of course, we just navigated through. The president just uh, signed a historic bipartisan budget agreement that removed one of the biggest sources of manufactured risk. So the manufactured risk that they talk about there is the debt ceiling debate, the fact that they had the potential of a default, which could have put us into even more of an economic tailspin. But the president said something interesting, Hallie, at a fundraiser last night, which is that every month he hears that we're a month away from entering a recession. It hasn't happened. And as he said today, that's not an accident. This is because of the policies he's put into motion. It's interesting to hear the way that the president is talking about the economy, um, because we know that that is such a thing that drives people out to vote, that people care about when they go to vote. There's something else that we know based on polling that voters care about when it comes to President Biden, and that is his age. That's just what the numbers show us. There's a new strategy around this, it seems, in the last couple of weeks. So President Biden taking this kind of funny guy tack, right, ma'am? Like kind of making jokes about it, being a little self-deprecating. Watch. I know I don't look that old, I know. I'm a little under 103. Well, I look like I'm only still 29, but... Uh, 
Think about it. I know I'm 198 years old. It gets a laugh when he makes these jokes. What's behind this apparent new strategy shift, man? So, Hallie, this is a strategy that's more of necessity than really of design, right? You have a president who every day sets the new record as the oldest president in American history. And as a, one top Biden official said to me, short of inventing a time machine, there's really nothing we can do about it. But they began looking at sort of a tried and true political tactic around the time of the president's 80th birthday last November, which is try to diffuse this with a little bit of humor. And we saw Ronald Reagan famously do this in the 1984 debate against Walter Mondale, said he wasn't going to make an issue of the youth and inexperience of his rival. And it worked. The president was reelected. But we've also seen older candidates running against much younger candidates try and fail in this endeavor. That's Bob Dole in 96 running against Bill Clinton. That's John McCain in 08 running against Barack Obama. They went on the late night shows. They went on Saturday Night Live and made jokes about their age. It didn't necessarily work. So what's going to make the difference? The White House is pretty sensitive about the fact that Donald Trump is not faced with a lot of the questions about age, even though he, before Joe Biden, was the oldest president in American history. And if it's a, a matchup between those two men, then, like we'll see in any matchup with them, uh, maybe some of these liabilities for the president fade away. Mike Memoli live for us there in Chicago. Ma'am, thank you. Come home safe. We are just hearing tonight from a lawyer for the family of Jordan Neely after a former Marine pleaded not guilty today to charges related to his death. So this lawyer says that a jury will see, in his view, that Daniel Penny acted unreasonably when encountering somebody who was mentally ill on a New York City subway by putting him in a chokehold back in May. Listen. We've all encountered that person. But what none of us did is walk up behind that person and choke the life out of them until they stop breathing. You probably remember what happened here. It was a huge national headline. Witnesses say Neely had been shouting threats on the subway when Penny pinned him to the floor with the help of two others. We want to warn you that the video of this incident, of what happened, it's hard to watch. We're only going to show it once just for the context here. Penny held Neely in a chokehold. Neely later died, and Penny says he was acting in self-defense. This case sparked so much anger, not just because of the delay in arresting and charging Penny, but it also brought up a lot for people about how New York handles homelessness and mental health. Emily Aketa joins us now. Emily, bring us up to speed on what happened in this hearing today and some new documents, some new evidence that prosecutors are putting out there. Yeah, Hallie, we continue to learn more information and gain more insight around what could be presented during the tri trial hour by hour. Earlier this morning, just before 10 a.m., we saw 24-year-old Daniel Penny enter the courthouse behind me. He appeared stoic, looking straight forward. The only two words he muttered the entire time were not guilty, and that was in response to the two charges he is facing, including criminally negligent homicide and second-degree manslaughter. In other words, that he acted allegedly recklessly, leading to Jordan Neely death. We also are getting some information from some of the court docs unsealed today, including some of the initial statements Penny made to police on May 1st, the day of that deadly chokehold. He said, in part, he was trying to roll up, referring to Neely. I had him pretty go good. I was in the Marine Corps. A man was acting irate, dropping things on the floor, saying he doesn't care if he goes to jail. He doesn't care if he gets killed or does. Now, uh, Penny wasn't arrested until two weeks after the fact. That delay resulted in citywide protests protests, even spilling onto subway tracks, temporarily shutting down some subway lines. We also heard from Jordan Neely's family's uh, lawyers outside of the courthouse today. They consider today the arraignment of victory, another step towards achieving justice. They say any reasonable person would know that a chokehold lasting several minutes long would lead to death, Hallie. What about Penny's attorneys, Emily? Because they have suggested that they're confident that a jury will see he's not guilty. How do they see it? Yeah, they underscored that confidence today. Also speaking outside of the courthouse, Penny's team saying that they believe the jurors will see that Daniel Penny had acted in self-defense, they say, and in the defense of other people around him. One of the interesting points they pointed out that they think the location of this case playing out in Manhattan will actually work in their favor because presumably at least some of the uh, jurors will have taken the subway, the New York City subway, as such uh, an innate piece of the city and the transit throughout the entire area. Uh, here's more of what they had to say outside the courthouse today. Danny won't be the only one on trial. The right and duty to defend one another will be on trial, too. 
So our legal team at Razor and Kniff is ready to fight for Danny and for every New Yorker's right and duty to defend each other when faced with grave harm. And the next hearing will take part in October, so still several months away, but you can bet a lot of eyes on this case. It's a case that has been a lightning rod, as you mentioned, for so many issues, homelessness, public safety, and race, to name a few. Hallie. Emily Aketa, live for us in New York. Emily, thank you. Some new video into us tonight of Russian President Vladimir Putin out in a kind of visible show of existence, maybe. Right? He's in the southern city in Russia, not mentioning reportedly this weekend's revolt by the leader of the Wagner Group. He instead apparently talked about tourism and expanding the brandy industry, but out there, again, trying to, it seems like, show that he is still the leader. He does still have a grip on his country. That's in contrast to what we heard from President Biden today, suggesting things are not looking good for Putin. Listen. Absolutely weakened, President Biden says. It comes as there's some new reporting out of the New York Times that the head of that mercenary rebel group, Yevgeny Prigozhin, who apparently tried to initiate this near civil war, as we know, suggested that Russian general might have had inside knowledge of this rebellion plan. That's according to multiple sources on the matter. The Kremlin says that's speculation and gossip and that the army was standing by Putin. Raf Sanchez joins us now from Ukraine. A lot of moving pieces here, Raf, right? You're seeing Putin coming out in this sort of show of... Um, show of visibility, if you will. You've got this reporting out from the New York Times and some others suggesting that Prigozhin may have had other goals, may have had potentially inside help. NBC has not confirmed that. And now you're hearing from an official about new concerns over nukes. Yeah, Holly. so part of this puzzle is playing out in Belarus, which is about 30 miles that way. Until pretty recently, Belarus, a quiet corner of Eastern Europe, no longer the case. One, it is the home to Evgeny Prigozhin as he goes into exile, going into exile presumably with a Kremlin target on his back for the rest of his life. And pretty soon, Vladimir Putin is going to transfer tactical nuclear warheads to Belarus. Now, in terms of Ukraine's response, President Zelensky spoke earlier. He said they're very closely tracking. Prigozhin's arrival in Belarus. He says at this point there's no indication he's bringing a lot of mercenaries with him. On the nuclear issue, we had a chance earlier to speak to the governor of Chernihiv, that's this border region, and I asked him how concerned he is about the prospect of Russian nuclear weapons just over the border. Take a listen. In this war, we have to be ready for anything. Of course, we are worried about the use of tactical nuclear weapons. Does Russia have enough common sense not to use them? I have my doubts. But either way, we will fight to the end, because this is our land, and this gives us strength. We are confident we will win this. And, Hallie, we've been talking about this nuclear issue for some time now. The message has been consistent from officials at the White House. They are not seeing any indication that Russia is getting closer to using a nuclear weapon, and there's been no change to America's nuclear posture. Hallie. Raf, you talk about what's happening on the actual battlefield. There was this attack overnight that is getting so much attention because it was on a local pizza restaurant, killing 11 people, hurt more than 50. Um, there was a local man arrested accused of helping Russia here. Tell us more about that. Yeah, so Ukraine's domestic intelligence agency, the SBU, is saying they have arrested a gas transportation company worker who they say acted as a scout for the Russians. I want to show you just a little bit of the statement the SBU put out earlier. They said, in order to fulfill the enemy's instructions, the agent, this gas worker, made a covert video recording of the establishment, the restaurant. After the suspect forwarded the recorded file to Russian military intelligence, the statement says the Russians went on to bomb this pizza parlor. Now, Hallie, among the 11 people dead there, twin sisters, 14 years old, Anna and Yulia, they had just finished the school year. They were going into their summer vacation. They were at that restaurant with their parents when that missile struck. Hallie. It's uh, horrific to hear, as is so much of what's happening in Ukraine. Raf Sanchez, thank you very much for that reporting. Coming up, we have some developing news just into us. Madonna hospitalized. We've just learned some new information about how she is doing tonight after days, apparently, in the ICU. Plus, new details on that former NFL quarterback killed while swimming off the coast of Florida. His death putting a spotlight now on the dangers of open waters. Stay with us.
We are getting some new updates now after that really shocking news that Madonna, one of the most famous names on the planet, was in the ICU after what her manager calls a serious bacterial infection. There is a source telling NBC News now that she is out of that ICU and recovering. NBC's Ann Thompson joins us now. She apparently um, has been in the hospital, was in the hospital, in the ICU for several days, and we're just learning about this now. What else do we know? We are, Hallie. Um, this apparently happened on Saturday when Madonna, who is 64 years old, came down with what has been called this serious bacterial infection. That word comes from her agent. Um, he says that she spent several days in the ICU. The good news tonight is that she is recovering. But the tough thing for Madonna fans is this means that her celebration tour, which was supposed to kick off on July 15th in Vancouver, British Columbia, has been put on hold. That tour was to be a celebration of her 40 years in the music industry, and it's a global tour that she has planned. But that is now all on pause as she recovers from this serious bacterial infection. There is no word tonight from her agent about where she was treated, where she is, where she is recovering, all things that her fans want to know, and most importantly, when she will get back on stage. But again, Madonna, in the last few days, has been treated for a serious bacterial infection, serious enough to put her in the ICU, but her agent says she is recovering. Hallie? That is the good news that she is, according to her agent, recovering. A lot of people, of course, uh, just stunned by this. Ann Thompson, thank you very much for that. Tonight, officials in Florida are saying there were no riptides at the beach where former NFL quarterback Ryan Mallett drowned. But they say they were watching conditions at what they describe as a medium hazard level. Overnight, we learned that first responders pulled 35-year-old Ryan Mallett from the water of a beach in Destin, Florida. Officials say he was part of a group of people that had been out there swimming and then struggled to get back to shore. Again, not a riptide. But we've been talking a lot about these kinds of rip currents, the dangers in the water here, because those powerful currents have killed 11 people along the Gulf Coast in just the last couple of weeks. It comes as first responders say they're really frustrated that a lot of folks are not listening to their warnings about how to stay safe when they're in the ocean, especially when it comes to these riptides. Stephanie Goss joins me now. What else do we know about what was happening in the water when Mallet died? So, Hallie, there was a, a yellow flag warning, which means people can still go in the water, but they have to be cautious, and there is a risk of rip currents. Um, you know, you cite that there were no rip currents there at that particular location, but, you know, if you're caught in one of those rip currents, it can be really dangerous, and the Panhandle has had a very bad month when it comes to people drowning in rip currents. Just one day in Panama City Beach last Saturday, 39 people were pulled out of the water. That beach has seen seven people drown this month, which makes it the most dangerous beach in the country right now. And they are seeing those rip currents again today. Hallie? The, the the sheriff of the county encompassing Panama City Beach, which, Steph, as you know, we talked about yesterday and covered that it is now the deadliest beach in the country, so frustrated, frustrated, right? Talked about these, what they describe as unnecessary deaths and say people are just not listening to the first responders who are giving them warnings, basically saying that they're giving them, I'm, I'm quoting here, that they've been cursed and given the finger. It seems like there is a tension point building. Yeah, because, I mean, these first responders, as well as the, the people who handled beach safety, they put up these warnings for, for a reason. And, and you know, the, I mentioned the yellow flag. There is a single red flag, which means there is a, a real danger of rip currents. And then there's a double red flag, which means don't go in the water at all. No one's allowed in the water. They've been issuing citations to people who break the rules. And a few beach safety people have been saying that they're actually telling people what to do and they're not listening. Listen to what this beach safety director said he he's a beach safety director for one of the beaches on the panhandle we've put a considerable amount of effort in, in effective messaging to let people know that the gravity of the situation here can be real even though they get the message they openly defy it and the results can be devastating
They can be deadly because when you get caught in a rip current, a rip current is a is a current that moves off of the beach and it pulls you out to sea. It's on the surface of the water. What you're supposed to do is not try to swim against it because it can right. be as extreme as five miles an hour. You can't swim that fast. You're supposed to swim parallel to the beach. So don't panic. Keep your head above water and try to swim parallel to the beach. Parents should put life vests on their kids in the water. Stephanie Goss, thank you very much. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, former President Trump is countersuing writer E. Jean Carroll, now claiming that she defamed him on TV. That's after a jury found Mr. Trump liable last month for sexual abuse and defamation, although not rape. When asked about that last point on CNN, Carroll said, quote, oh, yes, he did. Lawyers for Mr. Trump now say that counts as defamation. Number two, Costco cracking down on sharing memberships. They say they're gonna start making people show IDs that match the member card when they go to check out. That's because Costco says more and more people have been taking advantage of those membership sharing things that they're not really supposed to do ever since they started rolling out self-checkout at a lot of stores. Number three, the head of Anheuser-Busch, which is of course the parent company of Bud Light, is speaking today about the boycott of Bud after the company partnered, remember this, with a transgender influencer for an online promotion. CEO Brendan Whitworth tells CBS the company is now going to send some extra help, some money, to wholesalers and distributors who have been affected by the boycott. Sales of Bud Light have really dropped lately because of all the controversy around this. Bud Light even lost its top spot, the spot it held for something like 20 years to Modelo not too long ago. Number four, look at this video of a Royal Caribbean passenger getting rescued after falling overboard. It came from the 10th deck of the ship near the Dominican Republic, the Coast Guard says. The passenger was taken to a hospital and the Coast Guard says it's now looking into how they ended up overboard in the first place. Number five, check it out. This is Bell, a new autonomous robot fish that's meant to help researchers collect underwater DNA samples. People at a university in Switzerland made it her it, I don't know, she, she, it, it's cute. They say it's totally silent. It swims just like a fish, so it doesn't disturb the environment. They hope it gets accepted by other fish. They're hoping to use her to monitor the health of uh, like reefs and things. There's a little bell, put her in a fish tank. Tonight, we are learning more about what could be an extraordinary gymnastics comeback. Simone Biles getting back to competition in August for her first meet since dropping out of her final events back at the Olympics in Tokyo a couple years ago. I bet you remember that, right? Biles ended up pulling out of some competitions. She wanted to focus on her mental health because she was dealing with something called the twisties in gymnastics. And the twisties is exactly what it sounds like. The gymnasts go up, they get in the air for a move or a flip or a tumble, and they kind of lose track of where they are. That can obviously be so dangerous because you've got to land correctly in order to keep yourself safe. Biles, of course, is one of the greatest gymnasts of all time. She's tied with Shannon Miller for the most Olympic medals ever for a female gymnast. She's won 25 world championship medals. Noah Pransky is joining us with more. The potential significance of this maybe comeback is huge, right? Like, could we see her at the Olympics next year? So we call it a maybe comeback because all we know right now is that she has been named an entrant in this competition in Chicago. But the speculation is that this is a tune-up for the national championships later that month, a tune-up then for the world championships, which is a tune-up for the Paris Olympics. No one would be shocked if she returns to the top of her game, but she has been doing this for a long time. She has been a seven-time Olympic medal, as you mentioned, 19-time world medalist, the most decorated U.S. woman Olympic gymnast ever. But she's trying to make this comeback, potentially age 27 in the Olympics, something that would previously be unheard of. You think back to the 70s, I mean, Nadia Comaneci at age 14, the sport long dominated by teenagers. But these days, the sport has followed her. She's changed the game. She's really made it a power sport where strength is an asset and not a detriment. And at age 27, this kind of thing is a possibility, thanks to her strength and the way she's changed gymnastics. She has, and you talk about it, Noah, but like the idea that she has been such a voice, such a present, a presence on not just issues like mental health, but also testifying about abuse, for example, from that USA Gymnastics Dr. Larry Nasser. Um, there is a, a symbolism and a significance of her coming back to competition that goes beyond simply 
you know, the routines and the moves. She's had a lot of ups and downs over the last few years, and it was 2021, remember, she had the twisties, which for someone who doesn't know gymnastics, it's like the yips you get in golf or baseball. You just can't quite function the way you've been doing it for 20-something years. Um, this is what she said on the Today Show a couple years ago. I love this sport so much, but it's hard. I'm sorry. And I don't think people understand the magnitude of what I go through, but... For so many years to go through everything that I've gone through, put on a front, I'm proud of myself and I'm happy that I can be a leader for the survivors. If you remember, she did come back in the Tokyo Olympics to win two more medals after withdrawing herself from several events. She might be trying to make this comeback again, and she's inspired so many young gymnasts with her strength on the mat and on the bars. She may be inspiring a whole other generation, too, when it comes to mental health as well. Noah Pransky, thank you very much. Yeah. Appreciate that. Sure, okay. When we come back, anger in France after the police killing of a 17-year-old. What else we're learning about what happened next? Let's talk about the tense situation tonight near Paris with protests erupting over the police shooting death of a 17-year-old delivery driver. We're going to show you some video of what happened here. So this is it. You see two police officers leaning into the driver's side window of this yellow car. Then the car pulls away. One officer fires into the window. You later see the car crashed into a, like a post nearby. Lawyers say the 17-year-old, identified only by his first name, Nael, was hurt by a gunshot and died at the scene. There have been demonstrations now in protests. 31 people arrested, 25 police officers hurt. And look at this. This is the aftermath of something like 40 cars burned in protests overnight. The French government has boosted police presence. Officials are calling for calm. Matt Bradley is joining us now. Matt, bring us up to speed on what we're watching, especially as we, as we get into the, the night in Paris, the overnight hours there. Well, we're going to start seeing about 20,000 French police officers deploying all across the country, just girding for a repeat or even something worse than what we saw last night, with many police officers injured, 30 people arrested, bus stops, cars all destroyed by protesters, mostly in that town of Nanterre, which is where this incident occurred. It's outside of Paris. So that's what we can look forward to tonight. Now, how the rest of this goes, I don't know. But so far, Hallie, you know, this is following a very similar pattern that I think our viewers are going to be very familiar with in the States, where a lot of protesters were very upset, not just with the incident itself, but with the way that the police reported on it. We heard just a couple of days ago that the police, through French media, quoting anonymous sources from the police, they said that the police had said that Nael, the 17-year-old boy who was shot dead, that he had rammed into this police checkpoint and that the police officers shot at him in order to save their own lives. Now, then, private video that was circulated on the Internet came out. We've seen this kind of thing before in the States. Came out and showed that that story wasn't true at all. And, in fact, it looked as though Nael's car was parked. The police officers appeared to be speaking with him. They were shouting at him at one point, And then they shot him at point-blank range. So that is one of the reasons for this outrage. The other one is that the officer who was arrested for killing Nael, he is under investigation and could potentially be charged with manslaughter, not with intentional murder. And that's what the family of Nael, his lawyer, is demanding that he be charged with intentional murder, something like homicide. These protests could continue because they're not just about the death of one young man, though, of course, they are. This is about a policing in France that uh, a lot of French people think has become increasingly cruel and victimizing young men of color, mostly of African and Middle Eastern origin. Hallie? Matt Bradley, thank you very much for that reporting. Coming up here on the show, a new lawsuit against a center accused of misdiagnosing a woman's pregnancy and putting her life at risk. Our in-depth reporting on so-called crisis care centers in tonight's original. Plus, check out this millionaire who, despite all his money, has failed at something 27 times. We'll, we'll tell you what it is. So tonight's original now with in-depth reporting on a topic we've been watching. And tonight we're hearing from a lawyer whose client is suing a so-called crisis pregnancy center. These are organizations that some say try to push pregnant women not to have abortions. And they're not just in states where abortion access has been restricted since Roe v. Wade was overturned more than a year ago. There's one Massachusetts-based abortion rights group that estimates 
These kinds of clinics outnumber abortion clinics three to one, even in Massachusetts, which is deep blue. Our Ali Vitali has the story of a woman who allegedly faced a life-threatening pregnancy because she says she went to one. Tonight, a lawyer speaking out about what her client allegedly experienced at a so-called crisis pregnancy center in Massachusetts. Attorney Shannon Liss Reardon accusing the Clearway Clinic in Worcester of a misdiagnosis of her client's pregnancy, telling her the pregnancy was viable when really it was potentially life-threatening. If proper medical care had been provided when she went to Clearway, the pregnancy should have been terminated right then. Liz Reardon says it all started for her client, who has asked to remain anonymous, after a positive at-home pregnancy test. The woman searched online for a safe medical examination to quickly verify the test result. That search led her to the nearby Clearway Clinic. There, they allegedly performed an ultrasound, concluding her pregnancy was healthy. But a month later, her lawyer says, the expecting mother was rushed to the ER with severe abdominal pain. She had to have emergency traumatic surgery, which led to the loss of one of her fallopian tubes. The woman's pregnancy was actually ectopic. Her fertilized egg grew outside of the uterus, according to the suit. It's a rare condition, only 1 to 2 percent of U.S. pregnancies per the CDC, but serious, even deadly if left untreated. You can have rupture of the fallopian tube, which can cause dangerous and life-threatening internal bleeding. And in the case of Liz Reardon's client, could have, should have, been spotted earlier if the exam was done correctly. With appropriate training and, a, and an ultrasound that is performed correctly, uh, there really shouldn't be any mistaking a viable intrauterine pregnancy from an ectopic pregnancy. One of the reasons it wasn't, the case now charges, is because the Clearway Clinic's central focus wasn't on the woman's health, but on ensuring she kept her pregnancy. The goal of so-called crisis pregnancy centers like this one. They also very interestingly and concertedly focused on trying to convince her to keep her pregnancy going. These spaces present themselves as reproductive health care providers and come up in searches like the one this woman did. But they're actually focused on stopping women from getting abortions, according to the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. They've been a long-term and widespread barrier for pregnant women seeking medical information and care. No fight. No fight. No fight. But the dangers are seen anew now after the Supreme Court did away with abortion protections last year. There are around 4,000 operations like Clearway running across the U.S. per Planned Parenthood. In a statement to NBC News, Clearway's executive director, Jill Jorgensen, said in part, We cannot speak as to any individual's medical claims or history due to HIPAA regulations. Clearway Clinic has served more than 10,000 women and their families for the past 22 years and have never had a complaint like this. Liz Reardon says she hopes the suit will force Clearway to stop advertising itself as providing standard medical care and says her client is brave for coming forward. Unless there's some legal action, there's not going to be anything to, to stop these clinics from continuing their pattern of deception and misinformation. No justice! Another battlefront in the fight over reproductive care following the overturning of Roe versus Wade more than a year ago. Ali Vitale is joining us now. And Ali, it is noted here that you are in New Hampshire, right? You're traveling with Nikki Haley. The, uh, the access to um, reproductive rights, the abortion debate is playing on the campaign trail, probably more in the general than the primary. But tell me what you're seeing. Yeah, look, this is certainly an issue where we're watching the collision of stories and lawsuits like this one with the politics and policy of people who are trying to lead, especially on the Republican side, where we're seeing an active primary take place. And I know that while the thinking is that Republicans have pushed for this for a long time, I've covered repro for about a decade now, and it really does feel in this moment that we're post row that Republicans are in some ways the dogs that caught the car. And frankly, I don't hear uniformly from voters that they think that this is a good thing. Yes, I meet voters, evangelicals mostly, who are in this conservative voting bloc who say that the Dobbs decision was what they wanted, but that's not all of them. Listen to one of the folks that I caught up with today at the Nikki Haley event. Do you think abortion works as an issue right now for Republicans? No, because I think it's, div it's, it's divisive from where the general populace is. 
So, of course, that voter there is referencing polling that has been consistent over time, frankly, that shows that roughly that more than a majority of Americans, roughly six in 10 of them, want abortion to be legal in all or most cases. Certainly, we've seen this continue to play out in the post row polling environment. And it's why we're watching Republicans, in some cases, dance around this issue, especially when reporters are asking them where they think the weak mark should be. Is it 15? Is it 20? This voter in particular was talking to me about how he might might be open to supporting Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, but one of the things that he's concerned about for DeSantis is the fact that he will be tagged with the baggage of doing what he did in Florida, which is passing and signing a six-week abortion ban there. DeSantis has been notably quiet about if he would endorse a federal abortion ban and if it would be at the six-week mark, but nevertheless, that's going to be one of the questions I think that's asked of him, rightly so, as he tries to parlay his agenda from the Sunshine State onto the national stage. But certainly, this is not an issue that is going away. It's one that Democrats, as, as my conversations went in, uh, as we led up to the anniversary of the Dobbs decision, Democrats are seeking to leverage this. They see those polls in the same way that Republicans see them. And while Republicans might think they're problematic, and certainly you and I have talked to those folks and strategists, Democrats also see them as a huge opportunity. And we know why after seeing what they did for Democrats in the 2022 midterms. Ali Vitale, live for us on the trail there in New Hampshire with our original tonight. Ali, thank you. NBC News covers hundreds of international stories every day. And because you couldn't possibly read or watch or listen to them all, our foreign desk has done it for you. Here is some of what they're watching in a segment we call The Global. Out of France, Paris is banning booze at the 2024 Olympics, at least for the regular fans. If you're a VIP, that apparently does not apply. If you're looking ahead to a later Olympics, Australia came out today and said, don't worry, you'll still be able to get beer in 2032 when the, game, when the games are there. Eh. News you can use. Out of South Korea today, everybody got a year or two younger. That's because a new law took effect, putting in place the international age counting method. In other words, like everywhere in the world, most places, when you're born, you're like at zero. You turn one on your birthday. In the traditional method in South Korea, you're a year old when you're born and then another year older each January 1st. That apparently set to fall by the wayside. And out of China, a 56-year-old millionaire is thinking of giving up on China's national college entrance exam after trying to pass it 27 times. That's more than anybody else in the country. He first took this test back in 1983. His latest results, which just came in, were not high enough for his dream school. They were actually worse than what he got in past years. But obviously, this guy's doing fine. He started a business. He makes a ton of money. Go figure. Still to come. Actor Kevin Spacey back in court today in the UK over a dozen sexual offense charges. Why this case may play out differently than what he faced here in the US. That's after the break. Tonight, prosecutors are getting ready for Kevin Spacey's next court appearance Friday after he appeared in a London court this morning today. As his four-week sex assault trial begins, the charges against Spacey in the U.K. include indecent and sexual assault and one offense of causing a person to engage in sexual activity without consent that has a maximum punishment of life in prison. The actor faces a dozen of these charges alleged to have taken place between 2001 and 2013. He has pled not guilty to all counts. This sounds like deja vu. It is not the first time Spacey's been facing charges like this. He was also criminally charged with sex assault in the U.S. about four years ago. Those charges were ultimately dropped. The judge told the jurors in Spacey's trial they cannot let the actor's fame get in the way of the evidence they hear, saying, I'm quoting here, many of you know his name or have seen his films. That does not disqualify you from sitting on this jury. Ali Arruzzi is joining us now from outside the courthouse. So what's going to be, in the eyes of prosecutors, the difference now with this trial in London versus the case that was dismissed here in the U.S. in 2019, Ali. Uh, hey, Ali. Well, there are some, some differences. Firstly, the case that was in the States only involved uh, one person. And one of the reasons that case was dismissed was because of evidence. The accuser refused to give over a phone, which uh, Kevin Spacey said was used during the alleged assault. And Spacey said uh, the evidence on the phone would exonerate him. The accuser didn't uh, provide the phone and then refused to give testimony. Here in London, we're talking about four accusers uh, over a 12-year period. So, 
There's got to be a lot of evidence for the Crown prosecution here to feel like they could bring a case. But I have to tell you, Hallie, the case hasn't started yet. Today was just a jury selection, and it's probably going to start either on Friday or on Monday in earnest. And that's when we'll find, you know, how much evidence the Crown does have against Casey uh, and how much uh, the witnesses are going to give evidence, what kind of evidence they're going to give, what kind of scenarios they're going to paint for the jury. And that could be a lot more damning evidence than the case he faced in the States about four years ago. And the charges he's facing here are also more serious than the charges he faced there. The most serious of the charges here, uh, causing somebody to engage in sexual penetration without their consent, could carry a prison sentence of 19 years. So that's very, very serious for, for Kevin Spacey. The other charges, he could get away with a hefty fine. But if he's found guilty of the last charge, that's a pretty serious case. That's just one short of rape in, in this country. Yeah. But obviously, this case is going to go on for some time. The, the, the judge said that it's going to take at least four weeks, maybe more, for, for this trial to come to a conclusion. And he even selected two extra jurors because of the sensitivity of the case, saying that, you know, if there was a conflict of interest with any of the other jurors, if they happened to know Casey or any of the production companies he worked for and they forgot to fill that out in a form when, when they were signing up for jury duty, then they could quickly be replaced with another juror, which is also slightly unusual, but it also shows what a high-profile case this is. And there was a lot of media attention as well, uh, Hallie. There was a media uh, huddle here in the morning when he was leaving. All the photographers were crammed around him as he was getting into a, into a cab. And I think that's probably going to go on for the next four or five weeks as the interest in this case uh, remains very high. I'm sure it does. Ali Ruzzi, live for us there uh, from London. Ali, thank you so much. That does it for us for this hour and the one before it. We've got a lot more here for you on NBC News Now. Top Story picks up our coverage right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.